Hey everyone, welcome to Retire With Style. And now that Wade and I have moved on from our Q&A, what turned out to be an arc, if you will, we're going <laughs> to introduce the long-awaited arc on long-term care planning. So That's here right we go. Up. Yeah, what do you think, yeah, I Wade? I think we've been promising that we're going to start a long-term care arc for a long-term <laughs> period of time here. So we're finally getting to it. <laughs> Wait, I see what you did there. I see what you yeah. did there, buddy. Pretty good. Pretty good. No All pun right. intended. <laughs> so, what, what are we gonna? What in the whole arc? What do you? What do you? What are you? What are we thinking about covering here? Just to give everyone a little bit of a synopsis. Well, long-term care planning, and we don't know which, how many episodes this is going to end up being. But yeah, what we'll talk about today in particular is just introducing the topic and then specifically defining what long-term care is. Uh, in future episodes, we'll talk more about some of the statistics regarding who experiences long-term care, like how long, well, what percentage have a long-term care need, how long that lasts, whether it's less than a year, five years plus, that sort of thing. Talk about the continuum of long-term care with just in-home services, that sort of thing, assisted living, nursing homes, all the different uh, options out there, continuing care, retirement communities, uh, adult daycare centers, all of that sort of thing. Then we'll talk about the four main funding options for long-term care, self-funding, uh, traditional long-term care insurance, hybrid policies that combine long-term care insurance with either life insurance or annuities, and also Medicaid. We'll also, we'll emphasize not Medicare, but, but Medicaid is the fourth potential funding option. Uh, then we'll also talk about the uh, how to think about budgeting for long-term care and including that as part of your retirement income plan in the contingencies category of liabilities and what reserves you have available for that and, and put things all together in an action plan. So that's what's coming over the next four or more episodes. Yeah, we may have some special guests along the way. Yes, right. hopefully we will. We we have not reached out to individuals at the time of recording now, but hopefully that will yeah, align. They're not well. going to say no to you. They're not going to say no to you. <laughs> Use your turn on that charm, that foul charm. That's right. <laughs> they'll, they'll be getting in line. No, no, that's nice. And and but first, but first, anything new? It's been a while since we've been like live here. One uh, week. Yeah. <laughs> week, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. We, we, we have multiple timelines we have multiple timelines in this podcast <laughs> multiverse <laughs> yeah, we bashed a few of the q a episodes so it has been a while since we recorded got a haircut today you thought i was growing my hair out on purpose but the reality yeah. was i just had not been to get my hair cut for a long time probably almost two months yeah actually i i cut my hair yesterday uh but and the the irony is i don't know on the youtube you can check it out well, I don't. My wife cuts my hair. Well, my wife or my kids, whoever's like hanging around the kitchen. It's real simple for me. It's just a number three and just high and tight. Let it rip. <laughs> the paradox is, as I'm going bald, is the longer I let it go, the more it looks like I'm trying to like hide it or, or something. The worse it looks from a balding standpoint. So at this point, it's just the heck with it, <laughs> you know, but yeah, yeah. Shave so it's it all off. life's rich pageantry <laughs> when, when it right. comes to when it comes to male pattern baldness. Uh, <laughs> anything else, Wade? <laughs> oh, that was the big exciting thing, getting a haircut. Wow. Wow. <laughs> well, then, then let's begin. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Well, fire away. Yeah. Uh, I mean, so again, we're, we're now entering into the long-term care arc for the podcast. It's going to be multiple episodes. Uh, and it's important because at the end of the day, when we think about spending shocks for retirement, long-term care is probably the most significant spending shock in terms of if someone experiences a multi-year event in which they require moving to institutional, uh, some sort of institutional living environment, it could cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, even potentially in, in cases of dementia with, in some cases, 10 years of need. Of course, it could exceed at some point a million dollars, but then again, it, it may not happen at all. And so it's one of these contingencies where we really have to put some effort into thinking, how do we want to best manage this risk? Yeah, my take would be, I, I feel this is one of the most, when we did our DERISA, we, we introduced like retirement risks and we had like a spending shock category. 
and we realize there are two distinct levels of spending shocks that folks are concerned of. There's the normal spending shock of my my roof blew off and I need to fix that. And that's, you know, one of these expenses you didn't think of. The other one being healthcare related items, specifically the need for long term care. So it's something that's very salient among the uncertainties that folks feel they need to address as they enter retirement. And it hits both ways. It's not just for a client, you know, a, a, an individual themselves, but it could be for like in my situation, me thinking about how I'm going to manage this for my parents. And and so it it, it actually is it, it's a good topic because it hits many different demographics. Mm hmm. And I think in a lot of people's minds, you do kind of intertwine healthcare and long-term care. And certainly that makes a lot of sense. So probably a good caveat just to throw out there is, and we get this question a lot, when you see some of the estimates out there about what's the average healthcare spending people face in retirement, and you may see estimates like the $300,000 for a couple over their lifetime from age 65, that does not include long-term care. That That is simply paying Medicare premiums, out-of-pocket healthcare spending, not long-term care related spending. Long-term care is separate from those $300,000 style estimates you hear regarding it, healthcare expenses in retirement. It, it's funny, somehow Fidelity cornered the market on, on this kind of number. They're known for three <laughs> things, Magellan Fund, 401ks, and, and this study that everyone always refers to. Yeah, the, the cost of healthcare in retirement. <laughs> and it's... Even that's really just in for the average person, but but I, I think we've talked about maybe even in the Q and A episodes how that number can sound very big, but that is really just a translation of every year for a couple somewhere in the ballpark of eleven thousand. No, it have well plus inflation over time, starting at around eleven thousand dollars a year, but then with the inflation increases over time as well. Yeah, I got you. And the only other piece I would add to this, so people, folks realize, is long-term care. You're, you're thinking physical, but it's beyond that. Mm -hmm. uh, huh, yeah, physical needs, also mental. Uh, in cases of, and and we'll talk. Would we define specifically what is a long-term care event? It can relate to either mental or physical uh, decline. There can be medical needs associated with it. The need for like social interactions and that sort of thing is on, on the surface as well. Uh, just all the events going on that relate to either a physical or, or mental decline that people may experience. It can happen at any age. It's just as individuals get older, the, the likelihood or probability of experiencing a long-term care event increases with age. Uh, and, and so... I've already made this point, but again, to emphasize, and I won't keep emphasizing it, but this is distinct from healthcare spending. This is not, it's a separate budget category. It's not necessarily a budgeted category. It's its a spending shock in the whole context of the funded ratio that we, we talk about with how to build a retirement plan. It's that contingency expense. What do I need to have set aside in my mind to feel comfortable that I can manage a reasonable long-term care event before I feel comfortable retiring uh, with the worry that, well, if I didn't have this set aside, I, I may run into trouble in, in retirement. And so it's ultimately, if you end up not having a long-term care event, probably those funds are going to translate into part of the legacy at the end. But what do you need to really have set aside so that you could manage a reasonable long-term care event as you define as reasonable. And, and we'll talk more about what that is too when we talk about budgeting for long-term care. And, and and something to think about when you're when you're like envisioning your own situation, you could be 70 years old and saying to yourself, I'm, I'm perfectly healthy, you know, physically, mentally, socially, et cetera. But there's a little bit of a double whammy here in that it's insidious because when it hits, it the, the probabilities of having some need increases with age because you know obviously you're getting older but your ability to cope with these things decreases with age if you're not prepared for it so it it it, it really is the ultimate stitch in time argument to to really begin to take care of this because it's little you know little by little then all at once and then where are you mm -hmm. yeah absolutely like if you need long term care assistance it's quite possible that that will be a period in your life where you really can't be managing how to take care of all that, how to find the care that you need. 
uh, how to arrange the finances for that and so forth. And so it's something you want to plan for well in advance. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, an expensive long-term care event could derail a well-built mm -hmm. retirement plan. And that's why really you can't necessarily think you're ready to retire, ready for retirement without having first as part of the process mm -hmm. considered how you're going to manage long-term care. Okay. And the other piece, just to conclude that is the range of this can be from zero dollars. You won the lottery. You don't have a long-term care issue unless you, you, you tied in some tragic accident or something like that, but it's well, about a 50% chance of that. Um. Yeah. About 50% <laughs> right. zero. But again, the, you know, take that for what it's worth. Like you get hit by a bus. Yes. You don't, good news is you don't have long-term care. The bad news is <laughs> <laughs> you, you caught the bus. Right, but, right. Uh, that is one way to get out yeah, of a long-term care need. <laughs> but you know, there's zero, but there's also, if you, if it is something that hits, you're looking at a big number. Uh, and, and again, it, it can derail it. So I, I can't stress enough. This is something you want to take care of when you don't think you need it, physically at least. And it's hard to speak to a parent about this because it's one of those that they they have to begin to come to this recognition that, I need to be able to do this right now, even though I'm not, you know, it's, it's letting them know, Hey, you're not going to live further. Let, let's begin to make move towards this. And it's hard to bring it up simply because to the degree that they don't, it just puts more stressor on the children. Right. And that ultimately for people who haven't prepared a plan for long-term care, the default may be that the children will need to manage that for them or take care of them that probably be the live-in caregivers, uh, it's one of the issues that causes people to retire earlier than anticipated. There's three main reasons people end up retiring earlier than anticipated. Involuntary job loss, some sort of health problem of their own. And the third one is the need to become a caregiver for someone else, either parents, spouse, that sort of thing. So that does become the default plan in many cases. And if you can plan to not create that sort of burden for other family members, then you may really be glad you've done that should the, the need for long-term care arise. And again, as you can see, we're trying to use this time to stress the importance of this topic, <laughs> but this is the again, intro. yeah, this is the intro, right? But play the demographics. We're entering peak 65 this year. And that, that effectively is, I, I think the number is now 15,000, right? That the number of people turning 65 every day, is 65 is like something like 15,000 this year. This is going to be the highest it'll be. But the point that I'm trying to make is ultimately people will be living longer. And mm -hmm. so as people live longer, this issue is not going to reduce itself. It's just going to be more, it's going to be exacerbated by the fact that folks are living longer and you know, it, it will be just a normal milestone planning event that is going to need to be taken care of. Yeah, that, that's right. And there's some irony, perhaps, that healthier individuals are more likely to live long enough to need a long-term care, help with long-term care, yeah. than unhealthy people who may just simply not make it that long, or who may have a that end-of-life long-term care experience, but it, it ends up being shorter rather than longer, and therefore less expensive as well. So wait, how many pull-ups are you by now that we're talking about? You, yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I'm up to, to four now in one one try. <laughs> <All right. laughs> okay, so now then the question, and, and we'll get into this more with the budgeting, is how much to set aside for long-term care. And that really has to be centered around what you feel comfortable being able to fund, whether that's a, if I could fund three years in a nursing home, I'll be, I'll feel satisfied. You've got to kind of come to those determinations on your own. Now, ultimately, some of those determinations might lead to looking to set aside, say, three hundred to $500,000, which can be huge, uh, not, not for Alex necessarily, but for everyone else. <laughs> Suddenly, okay, I can't retire until I have another $500,000 saved. So there's definitely trade-offs involved in all that of not only trying to look for something reasonable, but something that's actually practical. I mean, reasonable for the long-term care need, but also practical in terms of what can actually be managed uh, in real life to, to be able to feel prepared. I'm still trying to think of a comeback with that, with that intro. <laughs> but, no, you, you're, you're all set. 
but uh, so long-term care expenses relate to, if you do have insurance, premiums for the insurance, although the point of the insurance is that it will then reduce the out-of-pocket expenses related to any long-term care event. But then just also the additional reserve assets you feel you need to have set aside to pay for those out-of-pocket expenses that are part of that liquidity category when we talk about the four L's. So you've got your lifestyle, longevity, retirement spending, legacy goals, and then liquidity serving as the reserves for your contingencies like long-term care. And it's really about how much, how big of a reserve bucket do you want to have in place to be prepared for the contingency of long-term care? So, so just uh, you bring up a good point to give people some sort of uh, visual here. And obviously I, I get that this is a podcast, but uh, if we think about that retirement income optimization path, that we've laid out and, and you're thinking about your assets and liabilities at the end of the day, your everyday expenses, your essential needs, your obviously according to your preferences and, and the resale profile and all that, but let's just split the, split the baby and go right down the middle. If you're thinking about funding your essential needs, you're thinking about funding that with contractual income or very reliable income. If you're thinking about funding your lifestyle and legacy desires, if you will, more discretionary stuff or things you want to leave behind. You think you're usually thinking about that with your investment portfolio. Obviously, you can buy an insurance contract that leaves something behind for your kids, but for the most part, right? But when you're thinking about reserves, you know, uh, you know, I'm sorry, I said it the other way around. When you're thinking about these uh, contingencies that could happen, the, the those kind of things, you want to sort of manage that with reserve assets that you have. Wait. Yeah, and that would be the the more the true liquidity mindset where you are distinguishing off these assets as being separate for reserves. If you have more of the technical liquidity mindset, you do just have that one big pot of assets you'll draw from as necessary. But right, if you are saying, okay, this is my reserve bucket, then there's questions of asset allocation. And should you invest these assets conservatively because they, they need that liquidity? Should the need arise suddenly? But at the same time, if the long-term care event is ultimately 20 or 30 years down the road, that would speak to wanting to invest those reserve assets more aggressively. So that that's definitely a, a part of the consideration as well. Yeah, and there's many ways you can play that. This could be where, listen, I'm gonna contribute, I'm gonna start contributing now to an HSA. I'm in my third, I'm 35 years old. I'm gonna start contributing now to to an HSA. And I'm gonna mentally, you know, push that towards healthcare expenses. And if I don't need it, it becomes my long-term care reserve asset. Mm -hmm. Well, that would, yeah, that would be one way to earmark yeah. a specific fund for yeah. health or long-term care related needs. Okay. Yeah. And I think you, you may have brought this point up already, but to emphasize again, this long-term care planning is not a comfortable conversation for anyone. And it's not comfortable to even think about the, this idea of losing independence. It's not something that people enjoy thinking about. And that is probably another reason why people don't necessarily plan for long-term care needs because they, they just simply don't want to think about it. It's kind of the same reason sometimes people don't like thinking about life insurance. It's, it requires thinking about unpleasant events. And it's yeah. something that really needs to be overcome to make sure that you are ready for these contingencies. No, and I'll, I'll bring my own personal situation here. This is where two years ago, I, I, I effectively had to help my mom, you know, put her in an, in, in an ALF, an assisted living facility in Florida, and she wasn't having it. And she's, you know, just dementia has, has, has you know, for a variety of reasons, she's just started with dementia and she's in her late 70s. She's not that old. And it was one of those things that she really was not having it. Any conversation before the need arise, she would shut it down. My mom's a very like, strong-willed lady and it was just it, it was it was difficult and she kind of did herself and and our and the kids a, a disservice me and my sisters now she, she's a great mother all of that you know i couldn't have asked for anything more but this this topic was just something that was incredibly sensitive for her because it, it was more of a, a loss of independence which mm -hmm. ushered in you have to kind of accept that this you know it ushered in this new phase in her life and she was unwilling to do so until the very end where it was, a, I had power of attorney and it was one of those things with my sisters and everything that it was just the best course of action to put her in. 
But even then, she couldn't afford it. it. It's one of those that we're fortunate enough that, you know, as a family, we could subsidize it for her. But if it wasn't for that, I, I don't, if she, let's just say if we weren't around or anything like that, I don't know what would have happened to her. You know, it would have been, you know, straight Medicaid and, and off you go. But it, what, what struck me more than anything was just, and yeah, maybe there are some tips and tricks I could have done beforehand, but even as a, ch even as a child of, of a parent, it, it's, it's tough to bring up without like ruining the evening, you know, if, if you will. And, you know, it, it, it reached a boiling point where there was just no other choice. It, the, the choice was made. She didn't have a choice at, you know, when, when the decision was made at that point, not because of us, but because literally she, it, it needed to be done re regardless. And it wasn't, it wasn't a pleasant sort of transition. And that's something in retrospect that, you know, with proper planning, things could have been done and wait, even like to the point of getting a reverse mortgage out on the house, you know, and you you know, pay for years ago. Care. Yeah, exactly. And it was too late by, you know, when it happened and, Look, even though, yes, I, I get the irony I'm doing this podcast here, people are people still. And it, it's just a tough thing to have. When, when, you, when you need to do it, it's kind of too late is, is ultimately what I'm kind of getting at there. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks for sharing that experience. Oh, yes. yes. <laughs> and that's one to grow I need, a, I need my chat GPT <laughs> to get an empathetic response for, for that. <laughs> Well, you gotta you gotta give the context of that one. What? <laughs> Wait, we were sharing before the episode that sometimes if you have to write a difficult email message, you'll ask ChatGPT to write an empathetic message. For you. <laughs> yes, I tend to be blunt with my emails, and it's hard to discern the the tenor of somebody. You know, like you know, I don't mean anything by it. I'm just like to the point. Sometimes when you're answering emails, business related. And it got to the level that I was telling Wade, I <laughs> I kind of put the person's email on ChatGPT and I just point blank, I just say, please write an empathetic response to this, and <laughs> of which this is the conclusion. <laughs> and it does a great job. <laughs> I'm moving up in the company, Wade. Everyone loves me now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You're empath empathetic. <laughs> yes, yes. That's me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. Well, continuing along here, <laughs> so we <coughs> emphasize this point again, because uh, this, and we use the term Medicaid and Medicare, it's easy to confuse those in, in one's mind. Medicare is the national health insurance system we have for people generally age 65 and older. Medicare does not pay for long-term care. Medicaid is the health insurance available for people who've effectively run out of other assets and income. Uh, Medicaid will pay for long-term care but to be eligible for Medicaid, you really can't have, now there, every state may have some different rules, but the, the basic idea is you can't have other resources or else those resources will be spent before being eligible for Medicaid. Medicare does not pay for long-term care. That can be confusing because under very restricted circumstances, there may be a benefit through long-term, uh, a benefit through Medicare that sounds like long-term care, but it would only last for at most 100 days. And we usually define long-term care as something lasting more than 100 days. So simply, Medicare is not for long-term care. It's not one of the funding options. Even if you have Medicare, you, you're you not going to be able to pay for... Much of long-term care is just related to needed with the helps for activities of daily living. And that's something that Medicare is really just not a part of, at least not beyond 100 days. And even in that very restricted scenario where it might seem like it's long-term care. And so if, if, you, if you think to yourself, well, I'll just transition to Medicaid, I'm just stating it for, with an abundance of clarity. That means pretty much the assets you have earmarked for essential expenses and lifestyle and legacy are going to be drawn down. So you can qualify for Medicaid. And so that's, that's not necessarily a, a good option. Right. And we can talk about this more in a later episode. There's a whole area of Medicaid planning and every state has different rules. Like there's some assets that don't get counted towards Medicaid and so forth. And so people strategize. So there's a minimum number that you need, uh, 50K, whatever. It depends on the states. Yeah. Yeah. But if you have the means to not be on Medicaid, you might appreciate uh, 
just as we go through time and as there's fewer and fewer resources available and a growing population of people with a long-term care need, uh, being able to self-pay may lead to a much more pleasant experience than uh, having to receive care through Medicaid. Not that Medicaid is bad, but if, if you have the option, you might prefer non-Medicaid care. Uh, and even if you were, say, able to protect your house or, again, depending on state, uh, still the state may come after that asset after death so that it's not ultimately getting it out of the, the long-term care pool for your, it's not a way to gift to your children in a manner that completely avoids the, um, the grasp of Medicaid reaching out to be re, uh, refunded as much as possible. Okay, so we, we did talk about too, just if you haven't planned for long-term care, you could create a huge burden for other family members. It's, it's another reason to be thinking about this. And the default people have always, well, having your children take care of you, just self-funding your long-term care until depleting assets and then transitioning to Medicaid. That, that becomes the default for people. And it's really just a matter of, is that the right default for you? Do you, or do you, do you wanna use some sort of insurance? Uh, is self-funding a reasonable option? Do you still want some insurance policy regardless, that sort of thing? That's more of what we're gonna be getting into in future episodes as well. And that being said, let's now, that, that was the introduction, but let's just, for today's episode, define what a long-term care need is. And I think that'll lay a good basis for future episodes. Okay. So what are some of the check boxes? You know, what are some of the boxes that uh, when, when, when you say to yourself, you need long-term care, you need to be hitting? Mm -hmm. and, and so specifically, it's it's more like if you had long-term care insurance, there's going to be a definition of what is a need for long-term care. And it usually relates to the activities of daily living and needing help with activities of daily living. These are also called ADLs for more than 100 days. So that that's, again, the, it has to be long-term. 100 days or more is how long-term generally gets defined in that context but needing ongoing help with the activities of daily living. Now, this yeah. is where those these activities are usually somewhat standardized, but if you are looking at long-term care insurance, you do have to be careful that uh, they are using the standard definitions around activities of daily living and so forth. Now, wait, so just because, you know, we get into the acronyms, ADL is activities of daily living, ADLs. Mm -hmm. 100 days, I'm just gonna throw some, out, some, some questions out there. 100 days in a row, 100 days within a year, 100 days in a row within a year, that kind of stuff. Uh, well, yeah, so that would relate more to the, if you have long-term care insurance and it has some sort of deductible type period of how, <laughs> how long until the benefits are triggered, uh, that's where what you're mentioning there could, could lead to different answers depending on the rules of the policy. But it's, I, don't, I think just to define long-term care, it doesn't necessarily have to be 100 days in a row, or at least it's not that you're receiving care every single day, seven days a week. Um, it, it's more just how the policy called this long-term care. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's ongoing, it, and it, it's ongoing for more than three months, that sort of thought process. Okay. And how does that differ from, let's say, my mom, well, I just set up the situation, but let's just say... My mom is living, you know, she's doing well and she's 80 and she breaks her hip and all of a sudden needs to go somewhere for a while. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of situation where Medicare may help out if it's just a short term recovery period. And there's a number of rules around being able to qualify for this benefit, like uh, in a hospital for at least three days in inpatient care. And then the doctor asserts that you need this rehabilitation um, that's covered through Medicare, and then you go to a facility, a facility that's part of the Medicare world, and, and you have this short-term recovery, that's where Medicare may help with those short-term. But if it becomes long-term, the Medicare benefits end entirely after 100 days. So if you start with that scenario, you break a hip, you're getting short-term rehabilitation, hopefully in those kinds of scenarios, the need ends before 100 days. If the need goes beyond 100 days, that's where Medicare is no longer part of that. And, and there's potentially a handoff to long term? Mm -hmm. 
Yes, if you had long-term care insurance, yeah. that's where the, the handoff would likely happen. And if you don't, that's why those are all the warning signs that we flagged earlier in the podcast. If you don't, mm -hmm. that's where, like sands of the hourglass, so are your assets if you need to fund some something like that. Okay. And the, the financial situation for your other family members who may yes. be called into service to care for you as well. Okay. And, act, you know, the, the ADLs, what, what, what does that mean exactly? Is there a, a defined term you know, yeah, that folks so can refer to? It's not 100% standardized with different insurance policies, but it's generally there's six common ADLs. We'll, we'll name them in a moment. And then to trigger the long-term care benefits, you it, it would need to be certified through a medical professional that you need assistance with at least two of the six common activities of daily living. If a medical professional certifies that you have that need, that would trigger that you could receive those benefits through the insurance policy. The six activities of daily living include bathing, continence, which is control of bowel and bladder functions, dressing, being able to dress yourself, eating, toileting, using a toilet, and then transferring, such as getting in and out of bed uh, would be the main issue there if you can get yourself out of your bed or not. So of those, usually people do need help with dressing and bathing first. And this is just an example of where you, you need to read the fine print in any sort of long-term care insurance policy. Bathing, we usually think of as like getting in and out of a, a shower or, you know, where you may have to step. If, if a sponge bath counts as bathing, it's easier to give yourself a sponge bath potentially than getting into a, a bathtub. So you have to make sure that their definition of bathing matches what you think it matches. But again, bathing, continence, dressing, eating, toileting, transferring. No. If you need help with at least two of those certified by a medical professional, that would trigger the eligibility for long-term care benefits. And that is, is two, would you say two is like the standard or some policies more than two? I think two is pretty standardized, but that being said, there could be some policies out there that okay. are different. This is now a very important question because I think I'm halfway there. And this is specific to dressing. Now, <laughs> how does fashion play into this? Because I'm, I'm right now in my mohair sweater phase. And <laughs> my kids are just hitting me up left, right, and center. Does fashion so play into this? <laughs> I think you're getting into what's known as the incidental activities of daily living. <laughs> okay, is, okay. As long as you can dress yourself. Oh, yes, yes. Not having the good fashion isn't necessarily... So it has nothing to do with my sartorial taste. It's more my ability right. to, to dress. Okay, perfect. The ability to get those clothes on. I wanted to make that clear. <laughs> no, no, no. All right. All right. That's pretty good. And so, let me see here. Any other issues uh, not from a mental standpoint? Well, I would think these things could affect, because we talked about it being perhaps, you know, beyond just physical. It could be mental incapacities. But, you know, when, when you look at bathing, continence, dressing, eating, toileting, moving around from the bed. I would imagine if there's some mental setbacks, you're going to have trouble doing a few of those. Yeah. And, and that's so like in the context of having this explicit definition of long-term care for, for our own individual purposes, maybe it doesn't matter that much. It's more about what triggers benefits from long-term care insurance policies. So cognitive impairments such as dementia, this is going to really vary by policy Sometimes an individual may have cognitive impairments that really should lead to them getting some help, but they may not yet be at the point where they have trouble with at least two of the six activities of daily living. So if the policy also allows for some level of cognitive impairment, impairment to trigger benefits without necessarily needing to show struggle with the activities of daily living, that would vary from policy to policy. And I'm sure there would be some need for a psychological evaluation or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then that, that incidental activities of daily living, these are considered higher or, order activities. So having a good fashion sense is an example of that. <laughs> <laughs> but also managing household finances, driving, being able to clean your house, uh, these are important things that people might struggle with, but that's not necessarily going to be something that would trigger a long-term care benefit. 
for these types of incidental things, so picking out your clothes for you, that's usually provided more uh, ideally through family or friends who you have available to help with that. Uh, it's not necessarily going to be something that triggers a, a long-term care benefit. No, but I can see here, this is the delivery of a chicken and the egg. Uh, and I'm, I know I'm putting you on the spot, but eating, right? This could go both ways. Executive functioning, eating, like I, I, I can't follow recipes anymore. Hence, I can't eat, you know, or I can't eat because there's no food or I can't like eating came up, right? Is it I can't serve myself the food or I can't like physically eat the food by myself? In terms of, yeah, being able to prepare, preparing food versus yeah, just executive... being able to chew and swallow. Exactly. There's an executive functioning component to preparing the food. And then there's Yeah, the and there, there's certainly going to be some there. discretion involved with the medical professional in those kinds of situations. I, I think it's ultimately, you don't have to create delicious food, but <laughs> it's going to be more, if, you, if you're able to get the basic nutrition you need, <laughs> then that would probably... Whether it's <laughs> however you make this food or whatever the case may be, it's, it's going to probably define more in terms of can you get nutrition or not at some level. Gotcha. But yeah, I, I think there's ultimately going to be some discretion and it will require reading closely what the specifically how the, the insurance policy defines that. But for someone listening in, the ADLs are considered separate from the, the incidental activities of daily living. <laughs> right. Yes. Incidental are things that are not going to trigger long-term care. That's kind of what I'm trying to de create, discriminate between. Okay. I think wait, that's, that's good for laying the groundwork for the importance of long-term care. And, you know, what are some qualifications for long-term care, knowing that results vary depending on the policy? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and so, yeah, that's an introduction. And then we'll, in our next episode, we'll continue on and, and talk about the costs and prevalence of long-term care in terms of the probabilities of experiencing events and, and what those events may cost. It's a lot of fun to look forward to in the next episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're like the heart. <laughs> Let me leave it right there. <laughs> All right. All right, everyone. Thank you for listening Ghost in. Of sunshine. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I was like <laughs> depressing, man. No, no. But uh we'll we'll hit you folks up next week and uh we'll bring more sunshine to the long term care fog. How's that way? That's the best I can that do. Sounds great. <laughs> All right, everyone. Thank you for listening in. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>